Hello there and welcome back to Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. My name is Bobby Lucier. We're here on April 26th with about two weeks left in the legislative session this year and there's still a lot of work left to be done. There's a budget bill yet to be passed and big uh, movement on housing, public safety, and tax impacts. Lots left to do for the legislators here in Montpelier. So let's head into the building and see what we can find out from our legislators here. So I serve on Senate Transportation in the morning and Senate Finance in the afternoon. On Senate Transportation, uh, one bill that I'm glad we got through and I hear that the House is going to send it back to us with some additional changes to that I, I think will make it better. Um, is something that I think Vermont could do better, which is automated license plate readers for work zones. Uh, so it's just using technology. All of our neighbors do this uh, to put up uh, cameras to basically track license plates that are uh, speeding through work zones. About three or four years ago, we had a flagger die, and this is something that is proven to uh, uh, change behavior so I think it's something that's really worth doing it'll be a pilot for three years and we we put some good uh, protections in there for privacy around the license plates I'm also really glad that the Senate version of the transportation bill has a million dollars for Green Mountain Transit really important for my constituency uh, we need to support that system they are looking at a major budget deficit so there's going to be service reductions but this one-time million dollars will give them a little bit of a, a buffer a grace period as they recalibrate and also look at restructuring a lot of their service service around possibly more microtransit solutions for the evenings and weekend hours, which just they're not people, people aren't taking the bus. And so we have to look at cheaper ways than those fixed route, big expensive buses roaming around town empty in the nights and weekends. But we still need people that work those off shifts to have options. And so this will give them the time to find other options. Something that might get a little bit of press is the Senate version of the transportation bill also includes a new fee um, on uh, a battery electric vehicles and uh, plug-in hybrid of vehicles. And it would be $89 per year on when they register their car or half of that for the plug-in hybrids. This is a, a transitionary uh, connect collection method to basically uh, pay for the paving, plowing, and painting of the streets that electric cars need. They aren't paying at the pump because they're not buying gas and we are seeing declining gas tax revenues which is a good thing because we're burning less gas, which is what we want, but we still need to keep our roads safe. And so this is until we can implement a mileage basis usage fee at the time of vehicle inspection. This is a transitionary fee that should generate a, the, the necessary money that we are dedicating, dedicating to all those electric vehicle owners out there, um, more charging infrastructure. So to get people to buy electric vehicles, I know it's been a hesitation for me to go all electric. I drive hybrids, but as soon as the electric chargers are out there, it's going to address my range anxiety. So over on finance, which has gotten a lot more press of late. Um, we are, the Senate is proposing a streaming tax. So I don't know if you all know this, but cable companies, um, Vermont um, Access Network, as well as uh, Town Meeting TV, gets a lot of revenues from cable companies that pay this to the Access Management Organization, a 5% franchise fee, uh, which is where a large part of your funding is. But people have increasingly been cutting the cord, meaning they are no longer paying for cable TV services and just over the top ordering from Netflix, Disney, Hulu, uh, myself included. I cut the cord about two years ago and I don't pay for cable services. But that is a really important community service that was justified by the FCC to allow for these franchise fees back in the 80s, I want to say, because those cable companies were generating this content out of the state and then selling it into Vermont. But we need Vermont to have the capacity, capability, technical expertise, and local connections um, that only broadcasters like the WCX has had. And so this was a compensatory um, mechanism that uh, we are extending to the now over-the-top providers like Netflix. Disney, Hulu. I think I have like six providers. I can't even keep track of them because they're like five, six bucks a month. So this will be a streaming gross receipts revenue fee, not on Vermonters, but on the entities that sell the content into the state. And we're anticipating that to generate up to six million this year and possibly nine million in future years to get more money to the Vermont Access Network um, as they need it to supplant and continue to offer that really important community service of public television, uh, public access television. Um, the cloud tax, uh, this week, and actually more like next week, uh, we are just getting the yield bill, which is this really complicated term that's very difficult to explain. I'd need about two hours and I'd probably do it poorly on what the property yield is and how that affects our property tax rates, but we just got it from the house. It was later this year because of a variety of reasons, one being uh, more than a third of our school district budgets failed for compounding factors, so we are getting it much later because we needed to have more information about what the budgetary outlook would be of the approved votes, the approved spending at the local level. 
And what I guess I'd summarize this, the challenge with Vermont's education funding system is that for the last 30 years since the Brigham decision, um, Act 60 has centralized the funding but decentralized the decision making on our education spending. So our local voters are voting on budgets and then we the state are collecting all the money from a lot of different sources, not just property taxes but sales tax, lottery taxes and so on. And then we're paying it down as much as we can from those other sources and whatever we don't come up with to, to pay for all the approved school budgets, that gets into this yield calculation. So if we have less to cover or more spending to cover, that yield goes up or down relatedly. And then that gets factored into this really complex formula that goes back to where your municipality is, what the common level of appraisal is, whether or not you're income sensitized. And I would argue that over the last 30 years, this has further distanced individual Vermonters from the um, the impact of the votes they're casting at the local level. They're not feeling the tax, the, the, the property, the school spending they're approving when they vote yes. And so we're looking at some ways to sort of realign, retweak, revisit, also look at what other states do. Vermont is unique. We have one of the most complex formulas, arguably one of the most fair, but many would argue it has got us to a place that's unsustainable. And so what we're doing now is recalibrating and um, what I think is worth reconsidering is a return to a foundation formula that still achieves equity, which is what many other states do. So the yield bill um, has some motions from the House on that regard and I think the Senate's going to look at that and possibly expand a little bit um, in some discussion. I think each chamber makes each bill better. That's debatable depending on the bill in the chamber, <laughs> uh, but I think it's the way the process works. Things get better. I've been talking a lot, happy to talk more about ed funding, cloud taxes, or so on, but does anything more you want me to elaborate on? Sure, so maybe chat a little bit about the budget. So the uh, Senate just passed a budget, the House has also passed a budget. Can you talk a little bit about the differences there? And specifically, there's been some talk about the impact on emergency shelter around the state, as we're seeing in uh, South Burlington and Burlington, a lot of folks that are um, struggling to find housing and uh, as the summer is coming around are uh, potentially going to be put out of um, their emergency shelters as a result of this bill potentially. So can you just tell us a little bit more about what that um, might look like from the Senate, the, the budget that the Senate has passed? So I serve on finance, which is where we raise the money, and appropriations is where they spend the money. And so the, the appropriation committee members have really been in the, the weeds, so to speak, on this. But what I'll say is from the, the presentation yesterday on the floor and also the reading of the issue, uh, I will say that the House and the Senate are very close, off by 2.2 million, but you raise a good point. The Senate's version does have a, a cap, a lower cap on the available emergency housing. This is doesn't mean that that's the budget. In fact, it has to go to committee of conference where the House can uh, advocate and press for um, expanded funding, possible additional revenue sources on this. Um, I don't want people unsheltered in Vermont. Um, I definitely support doing what we need to do to provide more roofs uh, for people to live. Also to better utilize our existing roofs. So I am uh, supportive of any rational and reasonable way to provide emergency housing, and, but I do feel like we're treating a symptom and not the cause. And what I believe the cause is, we have made it too hard to build a house or a business in some people's minds in Vermont for the last 50 years. So I'm optimistic that this housing bill, um, the Be Home bill, which is now part of S687, I might get that number wrong, which is arguably a, both a conservation and housing bill. I think his, I'm optimistic that it will do a lot of good things. I do have concerns with that bill, but fundamentally to your question, we need to build more roofs. We also need to better utilize our roofs, which is why I support aligning our tax policy with our housing objectives, our housing goals. I support taxing second homes a higher property tax rate. I'm also supportive of a short-term rental tax because people are seeing that they can buy up a house and rent it out as like a hotel, not meeting all the hotel safety standards. And that's, that's a house that's not housing Vermonters, which creates low vacancy rates, which pushes people ultimately on the economic spectrum out into the streets. So we need to build more housing and we also need to use our taxing to align and motivate and incent better utilization, occupancy of our roofs. And that's where I'm really proud of what Senator K. Sharam Hinsdale has been doing. She has been leading the charge on this in a, a very noble and bold manner. And so I, I fully stand behind her S311 bill and all of her good work there. I'm hoping that we can get this in both Senate finance and the full chamber uh, to a place that the governor will sign and that we will actually do some good to build more houses and reduce homelessness. 
another bill that's related to housing that uh, was passed by the House and is um, waiting on the Senate right now, is being considered in the Senate right now. I think it's H829. So this is a bill outside of the budget that would uh, increase, that would create a new tax structure to fund additional publicly funded housing. Um, and it looks like the Senate has not taken that bill up yet. Can you share a little bit of your thoughts on that, um, on that bill? So I, I think what aspects that it didn't take up might be some of the corporate tax increases or was that the higher personal income tax rate, which I believe in both cases would have made Vermont the highest corporate and personal income tax rate in the state in the country. Um, once you go to that well, you, you exhaust it. And I am all for fair taxation. And I will say that I'm not opposed to increasing taxes to justify and pay for, for uh, important public services. I will say that I want DC to do a better job to across, to levelize, to, to make level um, more of the income taxes collected federally so that we're not putting Vermont at a disadvantage with our neighbors. One concern that was raised that I, I share on the $70 million estimate on one of those taxes, I think it was on that housing bill, it was originally people, the advocates were saying it would be $100 million a year, and then JFO did their study and they saw $70 million a year and mapping it to Massachusetts which just implemented a millionaire's tax, this would have been a 500, half a millionaire's tax in Vermont. There's a diminishing return on that $70 million or $100 million. As much as it might bring that in this year, the I don't know many rich people, okay, but the few people that do give me a call, they're Democrats, they're Republicans, they're liberals, yeah, they're progressives. I'm thinking of like the Ben and Jerry Cohen. Um, they, they, the individuals that have a great deal of resources have options, and they also have second homes. And if we, if we make it so that they can, by spending 181 days in another state, and then keep this as a vacation home here in Vermont in order to justify a, a pay raise to pay for their grandkids to go to college or so on, I think we're not gonna just lose that 3% marginal income tax, we're gonna lose the entire 9% they were paying previously. So I, I would argue, and this is what um, has been proven out to some extent, as much as it might be 70 million this year, it takes a couple to five five to 10 years for wealth to migrate, and that would happen, and so we'd have diminishing returns. And as we reduce that tax base, it is a vicious cycle where it makes it harder to draw revenues. So my point is the Senate found an alternative path using DFR, the Department of Financial Regulation, fees on insurance companies to raise another 19 million, as well as the streaming uh, uh, gross receipts tax that we talked about. And we found that, um, I, I don't know all the specifics, and so I, I will say this, the how the bills that came from the House, my calculation, they were raising 130 million for only projected 130 million per year, averaging it out over 10 years, almost a billion dollars, for only spending that was like half that. So I also just, I don't see the justification for some of those spendings or those taxes. They also came over in a non-standard format where they weren't attached to the budget bill. I'm still relatively new around here. I think I can pull that card for maybe one more month. And so I, I will say this, they came came over at the last minute on, on not on the budget bill, so it seems to me that um, maybe the whole house wasn't necessarily in sync with how to fit that into the standard process that's been operating for some time. Does that answer your question? Kind of. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a, lot, it's a lot that you're working on. So um, before we wrap up, anything else that you want to highlight from the session? Any reflections on the session? And um, you got a couple weeks left here. What, yeah, what are you thinking about? Um, I would just say uh, I'm glad you're watching Town Meeting TV and uh, Vermont Access Network. Uh, I had a Vermont Public Access show back in high school, which I really hope you don't dig up. Uh, but you all do great work, and I love how accessible you make local community issues uh, for anybody that wants to talk over this medium, uh, because it's another way to reach people. So thank you for all that you do, and thanks for giving me some time this morning. Porter Costello, I'm from Danville, Vermont. And can you share why you're here at the State House today? Uh, to get the Eagle Scout because I got my Eagle Scout and wanted to take a tour. Sure. Um, what, uh, what does it mean to you to become an Eagle Scout? Uh, what, what does that mean to you? Um, it was a long journey, so to accomplish it, it really means a lot. Was there a project that you focused on to, to get your Eagle Scout? Yeah, I, uh, I built like library houses in Elmore, and that was like my project. The guy reached out to me. Yeah. 
What does that mean, library houses? So they're like uh, little free libraries, and they're just right there in the park. So campers can go and take books and uh, put books in. Yeah. So I'm Mo Dennis. I'm the scoutmaster of Williston Troop 692. Um, we're here today to recognize all of our Eagle Scouts who, from the class of 2023. And uh, can you share a little bit about the Eagle Scout process and what it takes to get here today? Yeah, so Eagle Scout um, is a rank obtained, the final rank obtained for Boy Scouts. They start at the rank of Scout and they have to obtain seven ranks in between and uh, earn at least 21 merit patches and then they're eligible to go to a board of review and then obtain rank. Yep. How many of uh, your Scouts are here today? I have three here today, four that attained Eagle in 2023. Yep. Um, how uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the projects that your scouts uh, did to, to obtain this? Yeah. Yeah. So um, one of the scouts did buddy benches for the town of Richmond. Um, another scout did a bottle redemption for uh, the school of Williston. Um, and another one did bat boxes, so bat homes for um, the Arbor Foundation. And I think that was it. Yep. Why do you serve as scoutmaster? Uh, my kids are in scouting. I've done it for 10 years with my boys, um, and it means a lot for me to mentor young uh, kids and coach kids and, and give them a good foundation for the future. So I represent the town of Essex and a portion of the city of Essex Junction, and I serve on house transportation. Can you tell us a little bit about what you've been working on this session? Yes, sure. So um, the Transportation Committee um, works on the big T-bill um, from the start of the session both years. We um, do a lot of the, we do all the budgeting basically of, of a massive um, budget and uh, then the once we hit crossover we get the Senate miscellaneous uh, transportation bill so that has much more um, policy content um, and we're doing all kinds of things um, with that and we're going to actually, I get to report that um, next week, more than likely, yeah. And then um, aside from uh, my transportation committee um, work here, I have uh, been working hard in conjunction with um, migrant activists and advocates such as Migrant Justice um, and CASAN, which um, serves asylum seekers in our state to advance two measures. One is a housing measure and one is a access to higher education measure. Um, the housing measure is seeking to make it easier for tenants to rent housing without having to uh, give a social security number, give an alternative way of identification and way of proving um, your credit history and, and, and uh, such matters just because we're finding that there's a huge growth in uh, immigrants to the state that are not just going and living on um, farms. And so increasingly in areas of construction and um, uh, cleaning and commercial um, services in our hospitality industries and in our warehouses, we are seeing a lot of uh, people that are coming often with families, with young children, or um, who, who are in really cramped and unsafe and unsanitary conditions and with a lot of instability because their work is what provides them housing, but it's dependent on that work, um, on the employer. So that's one measure in housing that I've been working with um, folks like Migrant Justice. And then um, we had success in um, developing a policy for tuition equity, which 24 other states and the District of Columbia have adopted, which uh, takes advantage of um, or makes use of a federal rule that says even though public benefits such as higher education or post-secondary education uh, are normally out of reach for undocumented folks, if your state actually puts statute, uh, puts language into statute to protect that access to that benefit, it is federally legal. Um, and so states such as even, you know, Texas and Oklahoma um, and um, California um, and then just recently last year Massachusetts have adopted this. And so um, 
my house or the house bill that uh, a few reps, Rep Cole and Rep Holcomb and I um, co-sponsored and got about maybe 60 co-sponsors in total from all parties, including independents. And um, we, that bill didn't get off the wall in house education uh, in time for crossover. But uh, fortunately, Senator um, Hashim's bill, S191, made it across um, into house ed. And so we added our tuition equity measures onto that bill, which was totally germane. His bill would uh, allow for a sunset to, uh, to extend it a sunset that would give um, access to grants through VSAC to people who have been placed here federally and have federal recognition as um, refugees, um, Afghan allies, and uh, people who are on, on route to seeking asylum. Um, and so we added our our measure, which is to um, ensure that our publicly funded institutions of higher education and VSAC, um, well, first, our institutions of higher education grant in-state tuition rates, recognize residency, if you would otherwise be eligible for residency because you didn't move here just to go to school, you have been here for at least a year before school would start, that you would get access to that in-state tuition. And what we heard at first was, well, that's not really going to help folks truly because you still, even in-state tuition is expensive and unreachable, you know, it, it, it'd be unfeasible. And so then we worked uh, also in close conjunction with VSAC and they, um, figured out that they could do um, funding through uh, scholarships and there are in fact a lot of national scholarships and funding made available to students who targeting those those types of students and so fortunately we got all the institutions to um, to to agree to that they all wanted this and after many, many months of collaboration and consulting with national experts on immigration issues and higher education. Um, it passed unanimously on the floor with a voice vote, zero nays, um, just this week, which was really amazing. So now it heads back to Senate for, you know, because it was amended. But we're really excited, yeah. And just coming back briefly to transportation, the um, we've heard that Green Mountain Transit is um, struggling with revenue and its ability to um, meet transportation needs. Um, what? How did the Transportation Committee kind of approach supporting GMT this year? Yeah, so we have we have sort of different approaches. Um, the House Transportation Committee um, last year did. Um, Ex kind of internally moved moved money around so that um, we could give them um, a one-time, two years ago it was a one-time one million dollars for I think six months extending fare free, um, zero fare um, public transit and then last year we kept uh, rural fares free and extend and, and gave I think it was eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars to extend, um, to give the ability to extend zero fares in our urban transit um, system for another full year, during which time um, GMT was going to upgrade and modernize their fare collection boxes uh, and enable um, kind of a maxing out of, of monthly cost to riders. Um, and giving sort of two tiers and and you know I helped write the language that that directed them to ensure that the transition back to fares would be um, kind of a slow and careful transition with research behind it to ensure that people in our you know more vulnerable populations wouldn't be um, caught off guard or deeply affected and, and harmed by the returned affairs and so we think that um, they developed a really great response um, but there were a lot of bumps in the road um, that were you know perhaps out of their control including issues with the fare boxes and then um, more recently issues with the um, 
the app that they were going to develop that for people to be able to for for ease of use and um, unfortunately because there have been issues with the app development um, there you know there's been there's been delays in in what should have been a return to fares in January and of course without the fair revenue it has you know brought down what you you know what you can work with as a budget um, and so yeah I am I you know I represent Essex which is one of the biggest you know Essex to Burlington that is one of the most important public transit corridors in our state um, and so I I was very concerned that uh, when I heard the news that they were staring you know looking at a fiscal cliff um, the the budget bill, our T bill, uh, I believe was out of our committee by the time, you know, all of this sort of came about. Um, and it's tough to rework all of that. Um, but I know that the Senate has been has been trying to figure out a way to to keep um, Green Transit, Green Mountain Transit going, um, and specifically our urban, our urban, you know, our our we've come up with a lot of alternatives um, for on-demand transit in our rural areas where a fixed route doesn't make much sense um, but I think that you know we're we're trying to encourage GMT to um, to identify and um, and the agency of transportation to identify um, future plans for how to f how to how to come up with either budget efficiencies, route efficiencies, um, and generating more revenue, whether it's from the towns, whether it's from um, private or public entities that that benefit from having public transit, you know, so like global foundries or um, the colleges and um, and how to encourage more riders, you know, to take advantage of, of what routes we do have, yeah. Uh, I represent the Chittenden 15 district, which is a portion of Burlington. It's kind of in and around campus, north of Colchester and Pearl Avenue, Pearl Street, Colchester Avenue and Pearl Street, down the hill a little bit uh, towards the, the, the old north end. Um, so my constituents are almost 50-50 UVM students, as well as uh, longtime residents who live in, in the Centennial neighborhood. And I, I, don't, I don't know what they call that, the district. Uh, the North Hill District. Um, I serve on the Corrections and Institutions Committee. And this is your first session, correct? How's the? How, what What are your reflections on, as you wrap up your first uh, your first biennium as a legislator? Yeah, the end of my first term. Um, and I've been saying this often. I think um, I I think quickly realized. So this is going back to last year. Um, the requirement to to really adjust my barometer of of disillusionment. Um, I came in fairly optimistic that we were going to do big changes, and we certainly have seen some some big changes. The child care bill last year, um, I think, is a great example. Um, the impact the Progressive Party was able to have on the general assistance housing program, I think, is a good example. Um, and being, uh, you know, a consistent and strong voice um, for the underrepresented Vermonters. Um, I, I feel good about that. I had to learn, though, kind of what it's like to watch really good policy get watered down um, through the committee, um, through the big floor debate, and then through the other body. Um, so that, that persists for me. Um, I'm really proud of some of the more progressive taxation that happened as we were trying to figure out how to purchase down the property tax increase that everybody's talking about. I was glad to see that the, the taxes suggested don't necessarily land um, as much as they always have on the middle class and the underclass. Um, been really frustrating to see bills that we have sent over to the other body come back. Um, doing damage I think. I think a good example again here we are a year later learning that uh, the Senate has really really pared down the general house assistance housing program. And I'm worried that 600 households 
um, are going to be evicted from that program and the impact that's going to have on all the other things that get big attention, right? Uh, the increase in crimes of desperation that are going to continue to show up, uh, the increase of the visibility of the unhoused and how that shows up in our communities. Um, I, so I'm really worried that that's going to show up uh, this summer and uh, kind of how that plays out. Yeah, so th I guess my answer to your question is um, I adjusted my barometer of disillusion after my first year and I'm still making those adjustments. Yeah, it's hard to watch. So you serve on the Corrections uh, Committee. Can you just tell us a, a bit about what your work there this session has looked like? Yeah, so the Corrections and Institutions Committee is kind of twofold. We do corrections policy, uh, and we are the committee that manages uh, the Capitol Bill. This is uh, the committee that um, decides how bonding capacity gets spent by the state, uh, especially on state buildings, new, new construction, um, and renovations uh, to existing state buildings. Uh, so we started the, this session um, talking a lot about flood recovery, uh, especially as it impacted state buildings here in Montpelier. Um, we've spent a lot of time uh, talking about uh, corrections policy. Uh, we have a miscellaneous corrections bill that's currently in the Senate that I think is gonna do some uh, lay some good groundwork for, for progressive policy and prison reform, um, especially I'm, I'm hopeful that we can keep some language in there that uh, requires us to really evaluate whether or not we should be utilizing private prisons in Mississippi to house our overflow. Um, to do that, we really have to start talking about our detainee population, about a third of our incarcerated population right now is are, are, are folks who have not even been sentenced, um, and that speaks to the backlog of the court system and how we have to how, how we have to impact that as well, um, and that competes in in really direct ways with what I'm seeing as a return to kind of tough on crime legislation, and and that is very much being suggested by the administration, um, and kind of sent this way to the House from the Senate, so. I'm really watchful of, about how some of those policies are going to impact our ability to um, reduce the detainee population. If we do that, if we can get, if we can stop housing incarcerating people who haven't even been sentenced yet, um, we can create space and divest from private prisons that we're currently using. Um, we're also the committee that's been um, preparing the work for building a replacement to the current uh, women's correctional facility uh, in South Burlington. And I think, um, I think most people will agree that that facility, 50 years old, is horrendous. Uh, and we should not be housing people there. We should not be incarcerating people there. And I know that it's a, a really big point of contention uh, as to whether or not we should even build a new facility, right? If you build it, you're gonna fill it. Um, I've come to the conclusion that um, we have to. Um, I, I disagree with the premise that there's no such thing as a trauma-informed prison. I think we do build and can build um, incarcerated facilities better than we did 50 years ago. I'm worried that the person standing here 50 years ago was probably saying the same thing. Um, so as we move out of the process by which we are purchasing land um, or deciding on state-owned land to build a new facility, I think the next biennium is going to be some really difficult decisions about what should we build. Um, and I know we're going to continue to have questions about whether or not we should even build at all. So. You've also worked on the just cause eviction uh, charter change from Burlington. Can you tell us about, about that? Yeah, for me, so the, the just cause eviction charter change happened before I got here. Um, and it was voted on, I believe, in 2023. Yeah, 2023, I think. Passed the House. Right, right. so Burlington um, residents overwhelmingly said, we want just cause evictions policy in place. Um, it passed the House, passed the Senate, was vetoed by the governor. And then the House was unable to override that veto by only one vote. And um, now Mayor Mulvaney Stanek, um, who was still a rep at the time, Representative Taylor Small from Winooski, who is, Winooski has also since passed Just Cause Charter Change, 
as has Essex, as has Montpelier. So more and more cities and towns are passing these charter changes. Um, so Representative Mulvaney Stanek, now Mayor Mulvaney Stanek, Representative Small have done an outstanding job at asking that question, when are we going to bring it back, when are we going to bring it back. I think this would have been an, a really uh, friendly body with which to revisit that question. Um, I've been disappointed uh, that that charter change hasn't been reintroduced. Uh, there is no expiration on charter changes on being able to reintroduce them. I, I think the the messaging is clear from residents of throughout Vermont that we want this policy, that we want this legislation. We've been told that we want to wait and create a statewide policy, and then we're simultaneously told that it's really hard to create statewide policy. Um, I just I, I think it's time to get that moving. Um, I can guarantee you that if I come back next year, um, I'm going to continue asking the question about when are we going to pass this charter change. For me, charter changes are a no-brainer. Uh, it's a clear local control issue for me. Um, residents of Burlington, residents of Winooski, Essex, Montpelier have clearly stated we want this. Uh, there is no harm to the state um, by, by passing that. I don't think the legislature, sh legislature should be in the way of, of passing those charter changes. Hi, so I'm Angela Key Contes from Mount Mansfield Community Television in Richmond. And I'm Tammy Riley. I'm with GNAT TV in the Manchester area. And why are you both here at the State House today? So it's uh, the big return of the Vermont Access Network to the State House. Um, we haven't been at the card room since the pandemic. So here we are today, and we're mostly here to say thank you because we've had a lot of support this year, um, both in short term funding and also um, we're working on a long term funding plan. Yeah, so we're um, really thrilled to see legislators in person and talk with them about the community media sector and our hopeful solution for a long-term sustainable funding stream to keep community alive in Vermont. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges facing access media right now in terms of funding and why um, VAN is pushing for new revenue sources? Um, so as we all know, it's a sad story of how cable is not going to be the thing that's around that most people are watching us on. And unfortunately, um, we are currently funded with mostly cable money in the state of Vermont, um, all 24 of us. I think most of us are 90% or more cable supported. Um, but in these days, as people cut the cable cord, um, we're looking for other funding sources. And um, one of the obvious places to look is the internet because more people, I guarantee you, more people are watching this video right now on the internet than on their cable television. Yeah, so the, the big picture is that the regulatory structure hasn't kept up with modern technology. So much like, uh, you know, we're earning tax on the sale of gas and people are switching to electric cars and so then it's a similar situation with community media in that the cable subscribers um, have been funding community media uh, since the 1984 Cable Act and the marketplace is changing and so we really just need the regulatory st structure to keep up with modern technology. We know that um, our communities need the work that we're doing um, and rely on us so it's really important that we find a solution uh, into the future. Absolutely. So I'm Senator Tanya Vyhovsky. I run as a progressive Democrat. Um, I represent the Chittenden Central District, which is comprised of most of Burlington, all of Winooski, a sliver of Colchester, and most of Essex. And I serve on the Senate Judiciary and Senate Government Operations Committees. And so tell us about a couple of things that you've been working on this session. Yeah, absolutely. So some of the things, um, I'll start with government operations because that's where my brain's at right now, um, that we've done that I think are really powerful are an update to our open meeting laws um, to really look at accessibility and transparency and utilize the lessons we learned in COVID and the new technologies we have available to make those government meetings more accessible to people. Um, that is S55 and it's in the house right now. I don't know what's happening with it, but um, we worked really hard on that and came to sort of a next step. It's not quite as far as I would like to be in terms of accessibility, but it I think is a huge step forward in allowing people to be part of their 
local and state democracy. Um, we are, act, um, I'm gonna head to vote on a bill that I am really excited about um, in GovOps as well. Um, I think it's H644. It's a bill that would allow youth who were in foster care to access their records from DCF. Um, also a compromise, it's not quite where I'd like to be because I, I think the scope is a little too narrow with only people who are in foster care and not anyone who has contact with DCF. Um, but I have a commitment from DCF and we're putting a report into that bill so that they will come back to us um, in 2026 with a plan for expanding the scope so that anyone who had contact with DCF can access their records. Um, in judiciary, today we took a look at H72, which is the Overdose Prevention Center bill to make sure that the immunity language um, in that bill is what it needs to be to protect people who are utilizing overdose prevention centers, and that should be on the floor next Tuesday. Um, so that's a really exciting bill, just given where we're at with the opioid crisis and the overdose epidemic, really providing safe spaces for people to not die is really critically important to me. That's, um, I've been working on overdose prevention centers since I was in graduate school, so it's also really just meaningful to me to get to see our first pilot site um, moving forward here in Vermont. Um, one of the bills that I did not personally work on and actually don't support um, from earlier in the session was S58. Um, that was a bill that um, is being packaged as a public safety and overdose prevention bill, but really it's a tough on crime, tough on drugs bill that I think is gonna do incredible harm. It's in the house, I don't know what's happening with it, um, but I'm hoping that they take a really deep look at, at the data and the statistics and what's proven to work, which is not criminalization. Um, it is not tough on crime, tough on drugs policies. We've got, you know, I would argue 50 years of evidence from the, the Nixon war on crime and the Reagan, you know, war on drugs that those policies don't work. They don't save lives. They don't reduce um, substance use. Um, what else am I working on? Can I ask you about the, uh, so the Senate just passed a budget for the state and um, it was similar to the House's budget in some ways but one way that was pointed out to be different is in the way that it funds um, emergency um, shelter and that there is a cap on um, the number of people that it, that it could serve in terms of emergency shelter. Can you tell us a little bit about that budget and what your thinking is on, on, on the budget right now? Yeah. Absolutely. I have significant concerns with that aspect of the budget. I did actually um, vote no on the Senate appropriations amendment to the budget, largely in part due to those caps. You know, we know that the people who are currently in emergency housing are largely extremely vulnerable populations, populations with disabilities, populations with children, and that that number currently exceeds the cap that was set. And I have real concern with unhousing anyone. I don't think anyone should be living without shelter, um, but certainly people with disabilities and people with children are at an added um, vulnerability. Um, the other aspect of that that was concerning to me and I, I wish we had taken a deeper dive into is you know these extreme weather um, carve outs that allow for this type of emergency housing only apply to extreme cold. And given what we saw last summer, um, I think it's really important that we start to think about extreme heat or unbreathable air as extreme weather events. You know, if it's not safe to be outside, we shouldn't be asking anyone to live outside. And just as you talked about some of the stuff in the judiciary, there's a bill this um, session to expand the judiciary and pay for that with new taxes. I know that hasn't um, that passed the House and is currently sitting in the Senate. Have you looked at that bill? Do you um, have any thoughts on that bill right now? Um, we haven't looked at that bill. I think that may be in the yield bill, but it may also be in a standalone bill. Um, we did put m some more positions um, to the judiciary. What we know is that there is an incredible backlog of cases and people are sitting before being adjudicated for three, four, five years, which just increases, you know, all of that additional contact with the criminal legal system has collateral consequence. Um, and so our hope is to provide some additional support to the judiciary so they can start to clear those backlogs. Um, you know, we had a lot of conversation around different ways that we might do that. You know, one way that I proposed that unfortunately didn't gain tra the traction I would have liked would have been to um, give the Department of State's attorneys a central office position to actually go through all of the pending nonviolent crimes that had been pending for longer than the minimum sentence and just dismiss them. You know, if someone has been pre-adjudication under, you know, conditions of release for longer than they would have been sentenced, it seems to me that one really good and just way to clear those is to just get rid of them.
Any other things that you'd like to share with constituents or think thoughts on your mind as we approach the end of the session here? Yeah, I think so. One thing I've also been working um, a lot on, and it's not in my committee, but it will be on the Senate floor next week, is the governor made an appointment to the Secretary of um, Education position that I have really significant concerns with. Um, you know, her, she's very nice. I've met with her, I've talked to her. It's clear that she is smart, but she's a businesswoman, not an educator. And I don't believe that we should be turning our public schools into businesses. And so I have really significant concerns with that appointment and I've been you know working really hard to make sure people are aware of those concerns and really considering the strength of our public education system and not further eroding um, that system by moving in the direction of privatization and turning them into a business you know Vermont in education in many places is at a really critical inflection point and is facing many crisis level things and I think we really need to do better to center everyday Vermonters who are going to be impacted by our policies, whose voices sometimes are missing from the building. Uh, I am from Chittenden Central District, so Burlington, Winooski, Essex, Essex Junction, a little bit of Colchester, um, and I serve as Senate President Pro Tem in addition to uh, being on the Appropriations and Judiciary Committees. So a little under two weeks left, or I guess exactly two weeks left here. So what, what have you been working on? What are a couple of things that uh, the Senate's been up to? Yeah, so uh, today we spent a lot of time on pollinators, on, on bees and the pesticides that seem to be causing their hives to collapse. And they're called neonicotinoids. The House sent us a great bill. Our Agriculture Committee did very good work on it. There was one dispute about whether to put the effective date out five years, which people felt was prudent given that you're disrupting the way farmers do their normal crops, or seven years. The committee came out with seven and on the floor we amended and moved it back to five. So we're now in line with New York. So New York and Vermont together in 2029 will ban these uh, neonicotinoid treated seeds and also air sprayed pesticides. Can you tell us a little bit, so the Senate passed a budget um, that is similar to the House's budget in some ways, but one of the big differences that's been pointed out is around the emergency housing program and, and a cap there. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Actually, the House and the Senate negotiated what is now the Senate's position. So that includes, among other things, as you noticed, uh, a cap on housing during adverse weather of 1,300 rooms and during non-adverse weather, 1,000 rooms. Rooms are now capped at $80 a night. I don't know if folks remember, but we were paying up to $140 a night. Uh, and so in last year's budget, we made a move to require that uh, we no longer pay those upper rates and negotiate to $80, which we did successfully. So what we're trying to do is create a version of the general housing program, the emergency housing program, that we can live with and pay for uh, and that helps to the extent that we absolutely can, but that is going to mean some caps on how much we pay and how often we pay. And the Senate has also received from the House a few bills in addition to the budget to raise some additional revenue. It looks like the Senate has not taken some of those bills up. Can you explain what the fate of those bills is or what the status of those bills are right now in the Senate? Sure. So the House did something a little unusual in that they sent us a budget and then they sent us uh, three bills that had major revenue increases in them. So one, for instance, around housing had a $75 million tax increase. Um, we generally tie those things into the budget, and the House chose not to do that. So the Senate has stayed with traditional you know, legislating and accounting where we're reconciling things in the budget. If we don't feel like we have enough money, the Senate did promote a revenue package to raise around $30 million, 25 to $30 million. And that's going to allow us to pay for increases for mental health providers, designated agencies, uh, other food shelf, food bank, other huge needs across the state. But at that, it will be about a fifth of the amount of revenue that the House wanted to raise. All right, that'll do it for this episode of Under the Dome from Town Meeting TV. You can tune into this and many more, including our legislator roundtables back at the studio on Monday afternoons this session on cctv.org, as well as Town Meeting TV's YouTube channel. Thanks so much for tuning in.